YouTube. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Candace Partridge. I am the Social and Sustainability Debt Manager for the Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick intro to this webinar. We're very happy that you've joined us. Um, just to give you some context, my, I've been the product manager in charge of building, launching, and maintaining our newly launched social and sustainability database, which happens to have a lot of overlap with municipal bonds, which is my true passion. Um, I have a doctorate in green municipal bonds where I did like a massive pricing survey. So this is kind of where I've landed the intersection of sustainable debt and municipal bonds, which is how we're doing this webinar. So I'm very happy to welcome you all. This webinar has arisen out of a working group, an informal working group of like-minded people like myself who are very passionate about building out the sustainable debt market here in the US, also in Canada. Um, this was triggered by a networking email that I received via Sean Kidney from the Great Lakes Impact Investment Platform. And we quickly connected with Nancy Kummer, who is our moderator today from BLX. And we all had this great passion about how we would love to build out more sustainable debt in the muni market. And so we thought it would be a really great idea to start an initiative where the first thing we would do, obviously, is have a webinar like this. So this is why we're here today, and we want to particularly thank um, our sponsors, the London Stock Exchange, because without them, this could not be possible. So I'm going to whip you through a very quick background um, about sustainable debt in North America. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen give you a very quick presentation. I promise it will be painless. Let me do a presentation. There we are. So this is a sustainable debt market summary, particularly focusing on the muni markets, which is why we are here today. Um, this is including both US and Canada because, especially because of our colleagues at the Great Lakes Impact Investment Platform, they cross the border. And so we don't want to ignore Canada and only focus on the US. We wanted to include them in our figures. So all of these slides include figures and issuance from Canada. Um, as you can see through this breakdown from inception of this market, which the first green muni bond was issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 2013, which makes me feel very old because that's kind of when I started on this project. And that was nine years ago. Um, we've had a total issuance of 134 billion US dollars. Because the green label is the oldest label, it represents 70% of that total. But as you can see, there's starting to be um, a few other upstarts nipping at the green label's heels. 2021 was a record issuance year for sustainable beauty debt, um, especially in the US. We got about 46.5 billion out the door in 2021. And while that sounds like, I mean, you can see the spike there in the chart, that's quite impressive. But when you compare that against, you know, the total SIFMA volume for the, of issuance for the year, that's less than 10%. It's better than it used to be, but we have a lot of runway to travel on, which is frankly why we're here, because we feel like it's an easy sell to start converting unlabeled muni debt into labeled. Some highlights of issuers that have been coming to market over and over again. Of course, we expect the market to be dominated culturally by California and New York. I'm sitting here in New York City, so they're very active. Massachusetts was a pioneer, so they're also on the list. One of the reasons that we did started this working group is because we wanted to, to start of shift the focus away from the coast and have more of an incentive to start issuing more sustainable and labeled debt in you know, the Midwest, the South, where I'm from. Um, I'm from Mississippi. If Mississippi can issue a green bond, which they have, I believe anyone can. So let's get on board with this. But the main issuers that we're dealing with, the huge ones, New York MTA, New York State Housing Finance Authority, I see so much from them. Uh, BART, SFPUC, which Mike Brown, our guest is here today. Um, LA County MTA. So this is a lot of transport, a lot of water. Um, we see some you know energy sometimes but it's really like transport and water that tend to be the greatest monolithic issuers along with affordable housing which is a huge huge presence in my database of social and sustainability 
this is my database, social and sustainability. You can see it's only been around for about four years at most. It's very, very nascent. It's kind of like, we're really kind of the stepchildren still. <laughs> we're trying to figure it out and find our feet, but it's really exciting because um, social issuance, as you can see, I literally just screened this week's batch of muni bonds into my database. Every single one of them was like three quarters was social, one quarter was sustainability labeled, and every single one of them was affordable housing, some with energy efficiency features. So for the muni debt uh, that is social and sustainability, almost all of it is for affordable housing. In 2021, 16.6 uh, .6 billion of social munis were issued versus 25 billion of green. So when I tell you we're coming for green, I'm not joking. And um, we're nearly on par for 2022. We've got 5 billion in each year to date, which I think is crazy and impressive. Interestingly, sustainability muni debt for the US is lagging behind compared to corporates, especially internationally. I see overall more sustainable corporate debt it vastly outpaced social, but it's the opposite case for, for, the muni de, for the muni label deals here in the US. Social is the predominant label that I see. So this is a quick context setter of like what we're talking about today. Label debt, the differences between social, sustainable, green. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. If you're interested in social and sustainable data, please reach out to me. If you wanna know how to issue these types of bonds, please reach out to me. Um, now, I would like to end that and transition this over to my esteemed guest. I'm going to introduce the panelist, and then I'm going to let Nancy introduce herself. So we have on the roster today, um, representing our esteemed sponsors, Aud Rajonson is responsible for fixed income origination for the Americas at London Stock Exchange. London Stock Exchange was awarded the Exchange of the Year, the Bond Awards 2022 of Environmental Finance. So they're kind of pioneering this game. They're trying to really build out a market internationally for domestic US debt. Emily Robert is with us from PIMCO. She's a Vice President and Municipal Credit Research Analyst, and she leads the integration of ESG factors across PIMCO's municipal strategies. And very importantly to us, she serves as the chair of the PRI Subsovereign Debt Advisory Committee. So she has a very broad view on these issues. And then last but not least, we have Mike Brown, the Environmental Finance Manager at San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. At the SFPUC, Mike has issued more than $6 billion in debt, including $3 billion in certified climate bonds initiative certified bonds so um cbi is always trying to champion certified bonds and so we're very happy to have him with us today and so with that i would like to hand this over to nancy to introduce herself and then get the conversation started thank you guys thank you candace i'm nancy coomer with blx group blx is a wholly owned subsidiary of or carrington ORC is um, uh, the nationally recognized bond council firm um, in, in the US. And so we service, we've serviced, BLX has serviced over 2,400 municipal issuers and borrowers since 1989. Um, and um, we work on various kind of post issuance issues. And I currently oversee our sustainable finance consulting practice. So I'm a registered municipal uh, advisor, approved verifier with the Climate Bond Initiative and a registered observer with the ICMA principle. So, you know, welcome everyone. For, for municipal market participants to plan an effective ESG roadmap, it's important to first understand where we are today. Many of them are either first embarking or progressing on their ESG journey because sustainable debt still represents a relatively small portion of the US municipal market. It was less than 10% of the sector's total issuance volume last year. But what's truly remarkable about ESG financing in this sector is the pace at which it's grown. It was just 3% in 2019, and we've seen a steep inflection with year-over-year -year growth of 75% over the last two years. This rising engagement has all taken place against the backdrop of the really resilient municipal credit with relatively strong subscription throughout the pandemic, which is to some extent um, telling us that municipal issuers marketing bonds as sustainable uh, in the US are generally doing so for reasons other than seeking an immediate economic benefit. 
My first question is for Odd. Um, Odd, we've seen shifting priorities under the Biden administration with a mandate to, take, to tackle climate change and boost infrastructure projects. However, municipal volume is down almost 25% year over year on the heels of a tightened monetary policy environment, as we've seen the Federal Reserve raising rates to curb inflation. Nonetheless, the global demand for US ESG investments um, currently remains very strong. So, you know, how do we reconcile the current state of the municipal market with this persistent kind of worldwide demand for um, US, you know, ESG debt and, and facilitate basically the flow of funds to municipal issuers and borrowers looking to build the sustainable economies and the resilient enterprises investors are ultimately seeking and essentially direct their capital to the municipal market's efforts to achieve climate well-being. Well, thank you, Nancy. And um, first of all, just wanted to say that it's a pleasure to be um, part of this discussion. I think, you know, the only way that we can get to um, greener economy and obviously stay a greener economy is that if the entirety of the economy moves on on a global basis, right? So we really need to make a much more radical shift so that ESG becomes, you know, what we call here in our exchange, like BAU, business as usual. And that shift requires funding, it requires capital, and it requires, in my view, integration. And so when we look at you know, the growing ESG needs and agenda for US muni um, space, which are you know, driven by and boosted by the political ambitions of the current administrations, we really need to look at integration, how we can integrate the US muni sector with the rest of the world. Because by opening up, um, the U.S. Muni can really benefit from some of the positive trends that we have seen uh, in Europe, but also beyond Europe, right? In particular, around the breadth of innovative structures that has come to market, um, but also the receptions um, from global investors. And Candice has obviously mentioned that you know earlier in the presentation, but there has been obviously a surge of ESG issuances in 2020, 21, sorry. Um, you know, from, from, from our exchange perspective, the amount of capital that was raised in 2021 was more than three times the amount raised in 2020. Um, and that was driving, driven primarily by public sectors, so governments, local authorities, public international institutions, which represents over 60% of issuance. Uh, green bonds obviously continue to be the most common type of ESG that we see, followed by Social bonds, um, I think there's been a global um, increase for social bonds in particular um, during COVID, right? When um, the proceeds of social bonds were used to fight, to limit the effect of COVID-19. Uh, but more increasingly, and that's really interesting, what we've seen is a clear growth and interest for some more innovative structures, such as sustainability linked bond, whereby the financing is linked to KPIs and it's not you know, based on use of proceeds. Um, we've seen like some you know, fantastic transactions. Like the government of Chile, for example, issued um, the first government sustainability linked bond of a two billion size, you know, 20, 20 year bond. Um, there was six billion worth of demand. Um, with the interest in the bonds tied to the country's performance uh, on its climate goals. Um, we've seen Bank of China, who issued a first ever sustainability relinked bond, essentially where the coupon payments of the bonds are linked to the ESG performance of a portfolio of underlying sustainability linked loan. Um, we've seen Republic of Korea, who was the first government to issue green bond denominated in euros out of Asia. And what's interesting is that really the size of these transactions were quite impressive. Um, and the demand was, was, was really there. You know, we've closer to home, for example, here um, in London, we had the UK government came last year with 10 billion um, sterling transactions and demand for the bond was over 100 billion um, sterling. So a high level of subscriptions, which 
then the result of that is a healthy pricing advantage, the famous, the famous green yum that everyone talks about. So I think connecting you know, the US community um, with the global ESG universe could be a real benefit for US muni issuers. Um, and that can really foster the level of ESG insurance that we're starting to see. Um, for them, it's, it's the opportunity to expand out to international investors in addition to their traditional um, US domestic investor base, benefiting from greater demand, the, the global demand, and potential pricing advantage. Uh, but it's also tapping into um, sophisticated and long-term oriented investors for sustainable finance. And it's also allowing US munis to explore and to try some of these innovative structures that I was mentioning earlier that we've seen um, on a global scale. Beautiful. Um, Emily, turning to you, before we dive in, could you take a moment to just describe, you know, how we think of ESG in the municipal sector and, and define it for, for us? Uh, great. Yes. Thanks, Nancy. Um, and thanks, uh, Odd, for that uh, uh, great, I think, summary of where things are at and, and some of the benefits to issuers. I think it's always really helpful at the start of these conversations to um, talk about how we define ESG, because I know every conversation I have about ESG, everyone seems to have a different definition. So, you know, I can really put it into two different buckets. So one side you have risk and one side you have impact. Um, and on the impact side is what we're going to focus on a little more today, but risk is where a lot of my, my time is spent as a credit analyst. And so thinking about from a risk perspective, how do we talk about ESG? Um, physical climate risk is a huge issue within the municipal space. And I think where a lot of our time is spent in thinking about this, uh, and it's helpful to get that information from issuers. So thinking about wildfire risk or flooding risk. Um, we're also looking at some social risks like demographic changes, population decline, um, you know, some of these areas is, is when we talk about the risk side of things or ESG integration, you'll hear it called sometimes. Um, and then the other bucket really is the impact side. So that's what we're focusing on mainly today, although I know we're going to get into risk a little bit, but thinking about um, what you know, green social sustainability bonds, these are really about how the proceeds are being spent. So what projects are being undertaken here? Um, and so you have investors who may be looking for something in a specific area, so wanting to fund environmental projects or, um, you know, projects where there's social good being done. So social or sustainability bonds might be more suitable there. Um, or you could have um, investors who have specific net zero um, targets for their portfolios and so wanting to look at bonds that are focused in that area and so that's kind of the more what is the impact of those bonds um, or in what areas are they in that the, the green social sustainability fit into. And it seems that self-regulation in this space comes down to issuers maintaining, maintaining trust with investors. Uh, municipal borrowers tend to be repeat issuers and so bridging the gap with investors should theoretically help them fare better in the long run. Um, institutional buyers aren't in the room with the finance team, the financing team, so so their voice isn't necessarily heard in the immediacy of a deal. But ultimately, there are long-term considerations for for municipal issuers. Um, so, Emily, the Principles for Responsible Investment is a UN-supported network of investors, and you are chair of the PR committee that issued a report titled "ESG Integration in Sub-Sovereign Debt: The U.S. Municipal Bond Market." It addresses the rising demand for incorporating ESG risk factors in the municipal sector, as well as ESG data challenges. Can you tell us how the credit analysis has evolved in the last few years around ESG considerations and why uh, investors are seeking more and more data around ESG factors? Um, yeah, so we, you know, ESG risks are not, some of these have been around for a long time. You know, some of these are things that we've thought about um, as credit analysts for many, many years, especially in the social and governance side. And it's really on the environmental piece and, and some aspects of social. I think there's been a greater focus on racial injustice and equity because of COVID and because of the events surrounding um, the killing of George Floyd and, and the protests and everything that happened afterwards. Um, on the environmental side, climate risk, you know, I think we've all just seen this in our daily lives where this has become such a greater part of everything that we, we look at in the world. It's becoming more and more accepted as something that is a risk um, to 
our, you know, to all aspects of our lives. And so this is becoming a, a much bigger part of our analysis as well. You know, we just saw in the last few weeks, Paradise, California, which was in the um, 2018 campfire had been, you know, I think about 60% of the structures in the town were destroyed, 90% of the population left afterwards. And this was not a, a tiny community. This was about 26,000 people. Um, and for the last three years, the state of California had been um, backfilling and providing um, property tax revenues, but that has just expired. And the redevelopment agency there just um, started using their debt service reserve funds. You know, and so we're seeing things like this happen where this isn't just theoretical, this isn't just a future risk anymore, this is something that's happening right now. Um, and so it's becoming a much, uh, much greater concern for investors. Um, something else, you know, we're seeing a change in um, difficulty getting homeowners insurance in some wildfire prone areas. There's a lot of changes happening with FEMA flood insurance, and there's an article in today's uh, Wall Street Journal looking at um, FEMA asking that areas that have, or homes that have had um, repeat flood events, that they may no longer be able to get uh, flood insurance through the National Flood Insurance Program. You know, whether or not that passes through Congress, we don't know. But um, there's just a lot of changes happening. And I think investors are very aware of it and thinking about how we might better incorporate that into our analysis. Um, and on the data side, you know, part of that we're trying to get from issuers. And so it's very helpful what issuers may provide to us in their, in their reports. Um, and then there's a lot of sort of third-party data providers coming up that are able to provide some of that information that investors and the rating agencies are tapping into. Right. So in March of this year, the SEC released proposed rules um, that would require public uh, companies to include certain climate related disclosures in their registration statements and periodic reports, including information about climate related risks that are reasonably likely to have a material impact on their business. While these proposed rules um, that really apply to public companies, they arguably establish a kind of best practice and um, uh, guidance uh, for municipal market participants. So for issuers looking to ramp up an ESG program, and again, bridging the gap with the investment community, what do investors specifically want municipal borrowers and issuers to do? You know, I think this is something that we're seeing implemented in many different ways. Um, so if you look at any given official statement, um, or you know, bond offering documents for municipal issuers. We see some where there's multiple pages about climate risk. Um, generally, in you know, this is the climate bonds initiative. So I'm focusing on climate risk, but there are other, obviously, other ESG risks as well. Um, but you know, we'll see, and sometimes it's just sort of a template paragraph that you can see was written by bond council and is not very useful for <laughs> for us. Um, it's just climate change is happening. We're aware of it. Um, and, you know, it's better than nothing. It's at least acknowledging that as an issuer, you're aware that this is a risk. Um, but, but really, we want to see, you know, we can get this data from some of the third party data providers, we can look on the map, we can see where you're located, we can see what some of the risks might be. But this is a chance for issuers to tell their story and, and really give the background and more information about what's being done. And so what risk do you see that you're facing? And, um, you know, and it's, you might look at two different places on a map and they both are located on a coast and think they have similar risks they're facing. But if one of them, the bulk of their tax base is right up on the coast, whereas another one is further inland, it's actually a different set of risks they're facing. Or one area might be more low lying or seeing, um, you know, the land subsiding, whereas another is not facing those same risks. So you can't tell just by looking at a map. So if you're able to provide any additional information around that, um, it's really to your benefit as an issuer because otherwise you might be, you know, someone might do a more cursory look at it and just assume you're facing greater risk than you actually are. Um, and so what are the what are the hazards? How significant is it? And what are you doing about it? Really is what it comes down to is what's the plan and, and where are you in implementing that plan? What resources are available either locally at the state level, federal level you can tap into um, to help you with dealing with adapting to, to climate risks. Um, or, you know, the other big side of it too that investors are often interested in is um, from a greenhouse gas mitigation aspect, where are you in reducing your overall level of exposure to greenhouse gas emissions? 
um, which may not always feel like the same connection to credit, but there's a lot that can be done there around, um, you know, if we expect that going forward at some point, we will have more stringent regulations, you're actually positioning your community to be further along in reducing those emissions. So there's a lot of benefit to, to starting down that path as well. Um, and so I think, you know, we acknowledge that there's capacity constraints, that not every issuer is in the same place, nor, you know, Candace um, mentioned before, like looking at issuers who are in the Midwest or issuers in other parts of the country that might be not facing right now as severe of risk. You know, I'm located in the Twin Cities and here, you know, the biggest risk we're facing is often increased precipitation, you know, a, a shorter season of ice on the lakes <laughs> that people, um, you know, have less recreational opportunities in the winter time. Um, you know, so some of that may not feel as immediate or significant, um, but there's still, you know, there's still value, I think, in reporting what you're, what you're facing. And certainly if you're in an area where someone's going to look on a map and say, okay, we can see this very immediate hazard, what are you doing about it? I think there's a lot of benefit to um, trying to report on some of that information. Today, we're talking about green social and sustainability bonds. What do you see as the connection between ESG risk integration and the issuance of labeled bonds? And what are you as an investor looking for in labeled bonds? You know, I started out talking about the two different buckets. And I think in a lot of cases, there's not as much connection as, um, you know, that they're put in the same umbrella, but that the risk side, really, it's different factors we might be looking at than the impact side. But one place where it really does connect is part of what's helpful, I think, and where we're evolving and moving towards with green social and sustainability bonds is how do these fit into your overall strategy as a, as a community, as an issuer, as a university, as a transit provider, whomever you may be. Um, and so thinking about if you have a climate action plan or if you have you know, certain equity goals for your community, that these can be a tool for how you implement those goals. And so thinking about how do you mitigate your risks and how can you use these bonds to help you do that and to help you adapt or to help you whatever it is you're needing to do. Um, and so they can kind of, if, you know, ideally best practices or best case for green social sustainability bonds is they're not just a one-off tool, but something that fit into your overall strategy. Um, and so if you, if you're incorporating all of that together in that strategy, then you can kind of tie it together. So I think we would want to see, is it part of something larger um, if there is available any sort of metrics around expected outcomes or impact that you, you think you'll have with these um, bonds, that can be helpful. Um, you know, on the green side, it, within the municipal space, I think we're not seeing a ton of the expected impact um, from a lot of issuers reported yet, but this is something that seems to be evolving pretty rapidly. Um, in some places, you know, affordable housing, that might be a little easier to report. Um, some of the other bonds, it's a little trickier to figure out what those metrics might be for impact. Um, you know, some I saw just one other example that's not affordable housing for sustainability. I know, Candice, you mentioned that was kind of the most common. Um, the city of St. Paul issued this last year sustainability bonds uh, for replacing trees. They lost an est about 20% of the city's trees were being removed because of emerald ash borer. And so rather than spend 20 years replacing those trees, they are issuing bonds to replace them faster. What made it sustainability was they're going to um, focus on low, uh, low income communities and replacing those trees first and also tied a jobs program to it. You know, so something like that, there's a pretty clear impact metric, number of trees replaced, number of jobs, you know, or outcome metric. And then you can kind of see what the impact on the community might be in terms of, you know, carbon, um, uh, that's not being emitted or that those trees are absorbing and things like that. So that kind of stuff I think is helpful if, it, if it's available, recognizing it's not always available. Mike, as um, investors are directing more and more capital to ESG funds, the demand is such that it is shaping and redefining what good governance actually means for municipal borrowers. So in addition to pension fund health and a balanced budget, we now have planning for a resilient and sustainable economy added to the list. In, pra in practice, ESG integration tends to go hand in hand with issuing label bonds. The San Francisco PUC has been a very early adopter in this area. 
In 2016, you became the first issuer in the world to certify green bonds under CBI's water taxonomy. And as you know, institutional investors are very sophisticated. We're seeing additional demand for well executed transactions that you know, not only adhere to the best practices with strong disclosure and, and transparency, but are also are supported by an effective go governance around ESG considerations. Can you tell us about your ESG journey and share your insights uh, for municipal issuers looking to ramp up an effective ESG program? Thank you, Nancy, um, and thanks so much for having me on the panel today. It's great to be with all of you. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. We're a department of the city of San Francisco. And um, I would say our um, the department's or the city's ESG journey began well before we issued our first green bonds. And along the lines of what Emily was talking about, I think it, it, it fits into an overall strategy that a that an issuer will have around um, what kinds of impacts it hopes to achieve through its uh, various investments in capital infrastructure and otherwise. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you some examples of, of the kinds of things we had in place prior to issuing our green bonds. Uh, for example, we had a climate action plan that uh, uh, required us as a city to be carbon neutral by 2045. We have a sea level rise guidance policy so that all publicly funded infrastructure has to take into account potential sea level rise or expected sea level rise. Um, we also, uh, from, from a very early stage, recognize that uh, these infrastructure investments are quite large. I mean, it's half, half of our budget. So we have, a, as a department, we have a two, year, a $2 billion annual budget. Half of that is for capital. And so we recognized early on that, that we can achieve the engineering uh, goals of the infrastructure, but also include co-benefits like uh, workforce development, uh, supporting local businesses, minority owned businesses, investment in the arts and education. We can achieve a lot more with these capital investments. And so that um, it's always been a big priority and also focusing uh, investment and attention in neighborhoods that have been negatively impacted by our operations. For example, we, our, our largest treatment plan is in a, a economically disadvantaged neighborhood. So we, we invest a lot in that community. And this was all before green bonds came about. And really I should point out that when we issued our first green bond in 2016, it wasn't really, it was really just recognizing the work we were already doing. It wasn't, um, it didn't require that we change our, um, our decision-making or project prioritization. Um, although we are starting to do that as well, we're working on a pilot right now to screen our entire capital plan uh, against our climate goals, as well as our social impact goals. Um, and I'm very excited about that because um, that will give us a lot of visibility uh, into, our, into our capital pipeline, as, all, as well as set uh, targets uh, uh, against our uh, infrastructure investments and our bonds that we issue to fund that. Um, I'll, I'll just add that we've, we've, we've been lucky as well to have a lot of policies um, that have been in place and to, to anchor the work. And I think that's very helpful if, if for, for governments, especially local governments. But if, you, if it's not really possible to get a policy in place, I think, um, and, and it's not always possible if the, if the climate doesn't allow for that, I would say just, you know, uh, just, uh, start start where you can, start small and build from there. Thank you. And, and the, piece, the PUC has issued more than $2.5 billion in uh, certified bonds to date. So, so as a repeat issuer of climate bonds, can you walk us through your decision-making process as it relates to issuing labeled bonds? And has your cost kind of benefit analysis changed over time as you've established precedents in this area? Um, right. So initially, we didn't know if there'd be a pricing benefit or reputational or any kind of benefit or if it would attract new investors. And we've been very happy to see that all of those things have, have materialized. So when we issue our green bonds now, we can count on additional investors showing up on our deals. Uh, with taxable green bonds, you know, for, for advanced refundings, we definitely are seeing a pricing benefit. Um, it's been harder to sh show that with the tax exempt bonds. Maybe that will change as, as rates rise. There'll be a larger sort of spread to see that benefit. Um, and uh, it, it's been very positive and that's allow allowed us to engage new investors, for example, listing on the London Stock Exchange. Um, 
The other thing I'll point out is that we have two large capital programs, one for water, our water utility, and one for wastewater. And we, for both of those uh, utilities, we have two very large capital programs and with 80 projects plus in each. And we've had both of them programmatically certified as a green bond eligible. And that's made repeat issuance very easy for us. So I would highly recommend that for those that, that have these large programs that are funded by multiple bonds over, over many years. Candace, um, in many ways, the adoption of ESG financing in the U.S. municipal sector is following much the same course as that of Europe's uh, regional debt market, but the liquidity in the municipal market makes it very difficult to find empirical evidence of a pricing benefit associated with ESG labels. Is there one? And if so, how would you quantify it for taxable and, you know, what Mike mentioned on the tax exempt front, it's really hard to, to kind of gauge. This is always the question. This is like the great Dorado of the sustainable debt market. Is there a greenium? How do we quantify it? So I did spend five years doing research on this in the specific sector of the green municipal debt market in the US. Um, and how I did it was finding tandem issues, a green and vanilla, where the bonds, the series of bonds went out the same time. So same issuer same projects, same OS, same documentation, same credit. Everything's identical except the label. And I did a bunch of um, yield curve analysis to judge the spreads and also regression analysis. In the primary markets, I finished this work in 2019, so this is slightly out of date, but in the primary markets coming out of that research, it was very hard to find what we call you know, statistically significant greenium in the primary market at that time, because it is like versus like. But in the secondary markets, I would see spreads opening up five basis points. And this was this was regardless of I only looked at tax exempt for this research. So this was all, you know, like versus like. Um, so this brought up a lot of interesting questions around, like, why would you not see spreads opening up further in primary? I think, honestly, it has to do with how the deals are marketed. It's much more of a closed loop when in the primary market versus the secondary I, I would love to see some way to have the primary market be more democratic, because if it was, then I think that we would probably see the secondary spreads transferred back into the primary. Um, I think there are more there's more retail facing in the secondary market. And there's more chop and change there. So it just has slightly more liquidity. I did a lot of liquidity analysis to try to judge, like, you know, again, comparing like market versus like market and similar deals. But liquidity is a massive issue for the mini market. Um, everyone is still kind of buy and hold, as we know. Um, that said, since I did my research, we can look at a couple of other tandem deals that have come out. And they, uh, one of them in particular was actually architected in order to try to prove that you could achieve greenium in the primary market. And this is the one that went out um, by Boston, I think it was December 2020, 21. Um, time flies. Yeah, they constructed this deal to see it was a negotiated offering. But nonetheless, they did this intentionally to test the market and prove the concept that they could issue a tandem series of bonds, one green, one vanilla, same projects, and achieve a spread. And they did a three basis points. Um, there's another instance where Oberlin College in Ohio issued a tandem series of green and non-green in parallel, and the greens priced tighter by five basis points, and that was a taxable deal. So it is true that the spreads are wider for the taxables. But I, I personally focus more on secondary as a bellwether to what's going to happen in the primary, because five years ago, the secondary market was five basis points and it's starting to materialize in the primary. So I'm kind of looking ahead down that. It's like look down the yield curve and see what happens. That's great. Everyone wants that crystal ball. <laughs> Very good insights. Mike, uh, your 2020 green bonds were listed on the London Stock Exchange which marked the first time a U.S. municipal issuer had listed bonds on this exchange. Can you tell us about your impetus uh, for doing so and, and what you've learned from this experience? Sure. So, um, yeah, as Nancy, thank you for pointing that out. So we issued our, our 2020 uh, uh, green bonds on the London Stock Exchange. The rationale there was uh, we understand, you know, that there's more demand for green bonds in Europe than there is in the U.S. We also know that a lot of... Uh, uh, portfolio managers require that the bonds be listed in order for them to be eligible. 
uh, for them to be included in their portfolios. So we knew we had to list. So we, we um, worked uh, uh, with the London Stock Exchange uh, to list our bonds. And we it was very positive in, in many ways. Uh, we received a lot of free media, a lot of attention for it. We won Green Bond of the Year, which was super exciting uh, from environmental finance. And uh, we also learned a lot that it wasn't quite so simple just to just to market a U.S. muni bond into Europe and expect that European investors would understand the credit and who we are. And and so I think what what has come out of that is that it needs to be part of a larger, longer term effort to engage with investors in Europe and um, introduce our credit, explain how we uh, you know, how that all works in the U.S. And also sometimes the structure can be quite different. Like we in the U.S. Um, muni market, like callable bonds, that's not really that common in Europe. Um, there's also bullet maturity. So there's a bit of a different structure that's more common in Europe. Of course, size is very important uh, to be index eligible. So there's a number of things that I think we still have to work through to be successful marketing in Europe. But I do think uh, that's where the demand is. And if we are to really uh, get issuers, U.S. muni issuers who are sitting on the fence, off the fence, and actually engage, we need to demonstrate that there is this increased demand and pricing benefit that would come from engaging uh, international investors more. Odd, this is a, an innovative approach in this sector in that it's a, a departure from the traditional negotiated or competitive underwriting process. Um, I know LSE has, was recently named Stock Exchange of the Year by Environmental Finance. And, and so your distribution, though, makes perfect sense, given the appeal of taxable munis to foreign investors. Um, since tr this truly is a, a global market, um, how can your platform help broaden distribution for U.S. municipal issuers? And, and what are the challenges unique to this market relative to other sectors utilizing your exchange? I think uh, Mike has, has done a fantastic explanation of that already, um, but a, a few things that um, I wanted to, to maybe um, talk about is um, the role of an exchange is, um, and in, Mike explained that, is, it's quite important in accessing European invest, international investors, because unlike the US domestic investors who buys a muni, a muni debt, many foreign investors are constrained to invest and trade in listed securities. So by listing the securities in Europe, um, and, and that applies if you see to just, you know, plain vanilla um, securities, but also ESG, um, sustainable instruments. Um, by doing so, so in US, in US issuers are able to retain, obviously, their core US investor base, but also expand um, across you know, Europe and, and, and Asia to really tap into um, investors who have like a specific ESG mandate and a dedicated ESG portfolio uh, and really can access that additional liquidity um, to complement their domestic investor base. And that goes back to the point Candice was saying um, about, um, you know, the issue in the sort of U.S. market being the lack of liquidity. Um, I, you know, I do believe that there's a solutions here by, you know, including, uh, integrating again with, with um, a broader market and including the European investor base. But um, the, the challenge um, here for the U U.S. muni space um, is, is exactly what Mike says is around the lack of sort of familiarity of um, European investors with U.S. munis, right? Because the U.S. muni sectors has always been traditionally um, a domestic market. And so, um, you know, investors in Europe are not necessarily familiar with the credit, they're not necessarily familiar with the tax system, they're not necessarily familiar even with the, the, the goals and the projects that the Muni um, have. So the, the biggest challenges is around investor education and transparency. And so this, there's a couple of points here to address that, um, in my view, is obviously investor engagement and building that trust and see that you were mentioning earlier um, ahead of ahead of any financing, really, because it's always better to engage with you and to have a discussion with investors when you don't need money <laughs> in a way. But to really increase that visibility um, with investors um, and, and talk about um, introduce the credit. Um, and this is where... You know, 
capital markets practice, such as non roadshows, for example, can be a valuable um, tool and um, a practice for, for US munis um, going forward. But also it's around the, the credibility of the ESG bond offer, offering itself um, and developing a robust and comprehensive policy framework um, or strategy with clear KPIs, working with um, external reviewers um, to provide second party opinion or third party verification align with uh, ICMA principles or other eligible standards, because ultimately investors will rely on these disclosure and these to make their um, investment decision. Um, and this is where the role of exchanges are important because they will ensure that these requirements are met um, to be able to admit their bonds on their market. From a London Stock Exchange perspective, we have our sustainability bond market. That's a market that we uh, have been built, that we built in close consultation with the sustainability community and securities that are admitted to this market are subject, are subject to um, robust standards um, to enhance investor confidence in the level of disclosure um, that is related to sustainability frameworks and reporting of um, issuers on our market. We've seen some volatility in this market in recent months in the U.S. Um, you know, odd with rising inflation and a tightening credit, can can a wider distribution be another differentiator for municipal borrowers? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very timely question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when we look at you know what happened yesterday, um, as, you know, following the, the the Fed's announcement to increase their interest rate by seventy five basis points, which is the highest I think since ninety um, ninety four. Um, yeah. So obviously that will have an impact on the cost of fundings for U.S. issuers, and that includes obviously U.S. Municipalities, and I think this is really where um, potentially looking at the global macro picture um, can be interesting because um, whilst the U.S. and the European and um, the ECB monetary policies are both following the same hawkish um, trajectory, the relative speeds at which they're doing so um, are slightly different, right? And so uh, the, the ECB is a little bit more tempered, and so that creates, in a way an arbitrage window for U.S. issuers. Um, and we see that already um, in the U.S. corporate world, um, where U.S. corporates take advantage of um, Europe, um, you know, lower rates to lower the cost of fundings. Um, but, you know, if you just looking at data, if you look at uh, the 10 year um, Treasury, U.S. Treasury yields today, it's about like, you know, three point um, thirty three person. And then you've got the German boons, which is at one point seventy one. So it's like, um, you know, 100, over one hundred and sixty basis points different. Right. Um, the, the U.S. being wider. So with this macro divergence comes an opportunity in a way, um, you know, U.S blue chip companies are issuing um, debt in a European bond market um, to not only diversify their, their funding base outside of the US, but also to capitalize on the um, lower funding cost when there's a relative gap in, in the rates. Um, this is essentially what we call um, reverse Yankees. And so there's no reason why um, the same strategy, um, you know, could, couldn't be emulated by the U.S. municipality sector. Makes sense. Um, U.S. municipal issuers and borrowers do have a unique profile and requirements. You know, does your exchange have a program for them? And can you describe the process for municipal issuers um, to list their bonds on the exchange? Mm -hmm. So... For, yeah, from an exchange perspective, I think our vision, um, you know, is, is that global financial markets have an important role to play in channel and capital to the green economy, right? So a stock exchange essentially exists to bring together those who have the capital with those who need the capital. And so we really are a facilitator of the flow of capital. And so we are agnostic in terms of issue issuers that needs to raise sustainable finance, but also um, agnostic about the structure, um, the currency, the format of issuance, for example. Our sustainability bond market has helped issuers across the globe raise more than 100, over $140 billion of um, worth of 
sustainable capital. And that's across you know, 80 currency, 18 currencies. Um, and that covers a wide range of issuers from, from, from governments to local authorities, to, to financial institutions, to corporates. And that also covers a wide range of ESG instruments, um, social bond, green bond, um, sustainable bonds, sustainability link bond, transition bonds as well. Um, and so, the, the, you know, there's we, we treat U.S. money in a way as, as no different from our perspective, right? Um, and the process of raising uh, bonds on our market has becoming increasingly easier, especially for the public sector, um, because U.S. municipality issuers now qualify at um, prospectus exempt issuers. Um, most of them do. Since the 1st of January 2021, um, the UK prospectus regulations states that sovereign local authorities and public international bodies um, are cons considered um, prospectus exempt issuers. And so what it means in practice for US Muni, what it means for them, it means that for those who are exempt, um, there's no need for them to submit um, a prospectus to be able to admit the securities on our exchange. Um, and in a nutshell, how would you kind of qualify the ancillary benefits municipal issuers should kind of consider about tapping into the European market? Um, I mean, obviously, apart from the broader distribution in the primary market, um, I think it's about improving liquidity of the bonds, um, you know, with a more active secondary um, trading, because um, obviously there's more investors uh, buying the bonds and then trading in and out of the bonds. So there's, there's a bit of like dynamism in the secondary market. Um, that is always going to be been, helps with obviously pricing. Um, it's worth noting that 70% of the global um, secondary bond trading actually occurs in London. So it really is this global center of, of capital. But I think beyond that, what Mike was saying is, is around profile um, because you know, obviously issuing for US Muni to issue Green Bond internationally that helps raising their profile. Um, amongst the, the US Muni, not just globally, but in the US, but also by showcasing innovation uh, and best practices among, amongst peers. Right. Emily, 60% um, of labeled Muni bonds were self-certified in the US last year. And this trend actually re has reversed this year. And we now see more municipal borrowers than not opting for an independent review. How do institutional investors approach ESG labels and does it factor in, in your analysis in one way or another? Um, yes, it does. Um, so I can, you know, I, I saw the Q&A question came in talking about the role of second party opinion providers. So this might be uh, yeah. a place to talk about that um, here. So, you know, there's the second party opinions um, or verifications like climate bonds initiative, the climate bond standard, or having a second party opinion from the International Capital Markets Association, ICMA, um, which sets out the green social sustainability bond principles that I think all of us are, um, you know, refer back to when we're talking about what is a green bond, social sustainability. I think there's another question on what is, how do you define a green bond? I think we'd all kind of, that's the broad set of principles that most of us um, conform to. Uh, and with more specifics, you know, in different ways, like from the climate bond standard. Um, and so the way we are looking at it, typically at PIMCO, we do our own internal analysis um, for every green bond if we're looking at buying it specifically for an ESG account to make sure that you know, we have our own internal scale that we score that bond on, thinking about how does it fit into an overall strategy of the issuer, the alignment of principles, um, if it's a label bond or it has a second party opinion. Um, and so what I've seen, and I'm, you know, there's another question I think came in on the Q&A on how would we um, decide whether or not to pay three basis points more for a green bond. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a portfolio manager, so I'll add that caveat. I'm not the one actually purchasing the bonds. Um, but I think with all of this, you know, from what I've heard from our portfolio managers is that if it's not a labeled bond, if it doesn't have a second party opinion, it's going to trade the same as any other vanilla bond. Um, I think there's still value in starting out that way where you're self-certifying or self-labeling. If you're not ready to go seek a second party opinion yet, um, you're starting to kind of get your ducks in a row. And I've heard Mike speak about this before that 
um, if I recall, San Francisco PUC started out that way and it just sort of gets the ball rolling and you start to see the feedback, you start to get it moving internally on how to get there. So I think there's still a lot of value in starting there, but you are not gonna likely see any sort of pricing benefit if you're not getting a second party opinion. And I know in the European market, I think those are required um, by investors. So there are more formalities there. Um, I think investors are getting more and more um, just wanting, you know, a little more certification or auditing. I also see just in general, you see a lot more information provided in the official statement if there is a second party opinion, which is very helpful. If you're just kind of putting a paragraph in there saying, we call them green bonds, um, you know, I think that's going to not going to be valued as highly as if you're going into a lot more detail there. Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything on the second party opinions. No, I, I I think exactly as you said. I think it's if you're if you're not quite up to getting an, an outside uh, certification or use an outside standard, it, the first step would be self-certifying and and kind of work from there. Um, I totally agree. Um, we and I think in you know in some cases we we weren't sure if certain projects would qualify, and that also was helpful to use an outside uh, verif verifier. Um, so if there's any doubt about your projects being green or not. Let's talk about resources to address the complexity of ESG initiatives in the municipal sector to effectively integrate climate and social policies in their financial and infrastructure planning. Um, governmental issuers are uniquely challenged in that they often need to connect the dots across many different stakeholders and organizational units. And so having educational content and cohesiveness is important to them. The GFOA issued a document titled ESG Considerations for Governmental Issuers um, in June 2020 that issuers should read. Mike, you are a member of the California Green Bond Market Development Committee, which has a, made some outstanding contributions to the advancement of ESG in the municipal market, and I think is a great resource for governmental issuers across all states. Can you share how the organization is evolving to play a more active role in this market and support municipal borrowers? Yeah, I think I think we're we're focused in three main areas on the committee: education, policy, and best practices. So currently, there's there's a lot of really good resources on our webpage uh, uh, related to the um, uh, sort of educating. Uh, I think we have uh, one webinar called Green Bonds 101. So from sort of from the very beginning all the way through issuance, explaining how to issue green bonds, what's needed, et cetera. Um, a lot of issuers in California uh, do have eligible projects. Kind of going back to what Candace was saying earlier. Um, you know, in total, the market's about 400 billion a year, but less than 10% are labeled green or social or uh, sustainable. And we know in California, because of, of state requirements, CEQA, virtually everything we're building here would meet a green bond, is green bond eligible. So we're hoping to get other California issuers. Of course, this is available to anybody to, to you know, this resource is available to any, anybody. Uh, wherever you are. Um, policy is another area. So working with legislators and other uh, officials at the state level to ensure that our projects and legislation um, is climate aligned, supports climate aligned infrastructure investment. That's another area. And then around best practices, this is a new area where we hope to um, uh, create a set of best practices for California issuers uh, to follow. Then finally, um, the GFOA held its annual conference last week in Texas. One of the dis uh, discussion panels addressed hot topics in this market, including concerns municipal issuers have around proper market disclosures on ESG issues. So from a general disclosure perspective, Dave Sanchez, the director of the SEC's Office of Municipal Securities reiterated that you know, traditional disclosure rules still apply and municipal issuers should continue to assess whether ESG factors have a material impact on, on revenues used to pay back the bonds. And there are emerging solutions out there to address this component. For example, VLX has an ongoing collaboration with DPC data using spatial risk software to surface these issues for municipal borrowers and issuers. But there is limited guidance out there on the subject of disclosure for bonds that are marketed specifically as green or social. Since climate certified bonds have emerged as the gold standard here in the US and, and Mike, you've issued several of them, what are your recommendations on post issuance reporting? Um, I, th I think what um, uh, Dave Sanchez was getting at was there needs to be uh, integrity 
um, among the issuers. So if we're saying projects are green, I would love to hear what Emily thinks too, but I think, I think if we're saying that projects are green and, and making those sort of um, uh, statements to the investor community, um, they really need to be green projects. And if anything should change with the use of proceeds, we need to be very clear about that in our ongoing disclosure. Um, for example, we issued, in actually the very first bond we issued, which was self-certified for our power enterprise, we had a change of uh, uh, use of proceeds. Um, this happens, capital plans change. So even though we self-certified that bond, we actually sought a third party verifier to let confirm, verify that the change of use of proceeds would, would not uh, change the green bond label. And ha happy to say that, that that's what that was the outcome. The, the new projects were also eligible, so there's no, no need to change the green bond. But we were but we include that that report with our green bond disclosure. So we have a we annually uh, disclose um, project spending, which is kind of the minimum standard, and we also disclose project impacts. And of course, if there's a change of use of proceeds. Um, we've really, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity with our, with disclosure for, especially for U.S. munis, because there's the, you know, the projects that are being financed by the bonds, but there are also often other kinds of benefits that are accruing to the community that it, it's, and it's an opportunity to report on that. So we, we list all of the activities of, uh, of our agency, the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we align them with the UN Sustainable Development Goals because so many of the, so much of the work we're doing um, in connection with the projects also benefits, has these other co-benefits like for the community, creating jobs, as I mentioned earlier, um, investment in the arts, education, there's all kinds of things. So um, I, th I think it's an opportunity to really showcase all the different positive things you're doing as an agency. Great. Emily, would you agree that the follow through kind of matters ultimately? Yeah, I know that, you know, we have, um... Some of our uh, ESG analysts will will reach out to folks at times to uh, you know we are looking to see if that's coming in and and following up through engagement efforts if we're not seeing it, and I would just say so it's not deterring folks that it can be as simple or as complex as you make it. So you know at the simplest what you're you're saying you will do is report on the use of proceeds, and so it, you can make it that simple where you're saying we said we would do X and we did X. Um, the more you provide beyond that is helpful, but, you know, not to feel like you have to provide all these impact metrics and all this other stuff just to issue green bonds or social or sustainability bonds. You can start out very simple and, and add to it over time, right. as I know Mike has, has suggested as well. Nice. Well, before we end, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their expertise and, and for taking the time to provide the, their insights into this burgeoning market. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us with follow-up questions or, or inquiries. We'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you, everyone.